Hey everyone and welcome back to Red Team Raw, a video interview and podcast series exploring the journeys of cybersecurity experts who have shaped the industry in some way. I'm your host Manit Saib, a fellow cybersecurity expert, Red Teamer and social engineer. I'm the former Red Team lead for the UK Central Bank, where I use offensive techniques to protect the UK's payment systems. And I'm now the Director of Global Intelligence at Picnic, a company protecting against social engineering attacks. So firstly, who's this series for? Well, if you're considering breaking into cybersecurity or an experienced professional looking for your next step or just a general a cybersecurity enthusiast, then this series will provide you with exclusive insight into people with offensive techniques who have walked the walk. Today, we are joined by an experienced penetration tester. He's currently a security consultant at Sec1 uh, here in the UK, which is a cybersecurity consultancy. He's also a very good friend. Ladies and gents, please give a warm welcome to Dimitris Palas. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invite, man. It's uh, good to be here, man. Hey, Dimitris, good to have you. Why didn't you Thank run through an intro? I did like a kind of formal one, but you go for it, man. Totally, yeah. So uh, just like you said, actually, right now I'm working at a consultancy called Sec1. It's been acquired by Clarnet, really. Uh, so my office employer is Clarnet. And I've been doing this for almost four years. Um, that means I moved to the UK just to do pen testing, actually. I used to do some tech support. I used to do some QA testing back in Greece. So uh, in 2018, I moved to London to work as an ethical hacker. And, uh, you know, uh, it's been uh, a roller coaster, man, with uh, what we've been seeing. I mean, the whole time. Uh, it's crazy, yeah. Yeah, man. Like, what, what are you seeing on the ground at the moment? Like, this Ukraine-Russia stuff is going off. I'm pretty sure actually it, it did start from the underground, like from Signal and Telegram or underground forums. There is actually a very popular forum. Uh, everybody knows it, actually. I'm not sure if I can say it uh, here, but it's been shut down recently. So uh, if you just go to the web page, you can see just a login panel, which is uh, fake, actually doesn't do anything. So it's been shut down and uh, Signal and Telegram, what I believe, like my personal opinion is that uh, it's other from there, like um, Ukraine, just seeking ethical hackers. I think it started from a small group out of Signal or Telegram. And then um, I guess they wanted to expand. So they used Google to, uh, I think it was Google Word or Google Cloud. Uh, I mean, uh, on the other side, like if uh, like someone can't find your Telegram, your secret tele Telegram group, then can you trust them enough with their technical skills if they just signed a, a Chrome, like a Google um, Excel document? I don't know. Like how to these people at the Ukrainian IT army validate? Like is there some kind of interview? <laughs> like technical interview? I don't know. Some kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's open to everyone, right? So you can add... And saying that, you know, we... Oh, we met on Clubhouse. So if you don't know, uh, we run a red team group on Clubhouse every Thursday from 8 p.m. And live when we were on Clubhouse, we were seeing like, you know, DDoS um, attack planning on there. So it's yeah. open to everyone. Um, and you see it like, you know, the Russian, I think it was railways that we were on the last session that yeah. was going on. And, and even like the leaks, the leaks were live. And then yeah. you see it in the news a few days later. Hey, Russian Intel docs are leaked. So... Um, it's fascinating what's going on and the world of OSINT. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, it's fascinating. And uh, of course, they would be targeting the infrastructure. I'm pretty sure like on the top level of this kind of, uh, let's say, groups or maybe the official army of Ukraine is involved, maybe the government. I'm pretty sure that on the top level, there's some kind of uh, organization like orchestration. For example, there is uh, just a few people organizing this and, uh, you know, having other groups do the attacks or leaking those documents and uh, everything in Russia. So, um, yes, we do have, um, like, ethical hackers from 
all of the world, like from script kiddies to senior pen testers, I guess, joining in, or uh, maybe we've got people from the intelligence, but I'm pretty sure there's some kind of, uh, and I hope there's some kind of um, filtering, you know, uh, because you, you wouldn't trust like a said kiddie to attack like Russia's infrastructure. Like, okay, <laughs> that's what, that's what they're doing on Telegram. <laughs> <laughs> they're like teaching people how to do denial of service attacks yeah um, there's people in there with the low orbit iron cannon i mean i haven't heard that in years <laughs> people yeah. just spinning that out pressing just, buttons you know, yeah it's fine yeah just ddosing uh Russian infrastructure no vpn or nothing you know imagine that <laughs> yeah that's another one like how do i set up a vpn and you read this stuff you're like mate yeah. just turn off your phone <laughs> because uh you don't want to be on on russian's radar right <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So let, let's park that for a sec, right? I sure. want to go into a bit more of your journey and like where you've got to where you are today. So let's let's walk through that. Where did you start from? How did you get there? Because one of the things that we want to do with this series is provide value for those starting out or even like you know who going into pen testing and, and want to go upscale into like a senior position yeah. or, or red team position. So what was your journey like? Well, yeah, first of all, it's great that we get to talk about this because uh, more and more people, uh, especially students and more experienced professionals, actually, they're looking to get into the industry. And um, you'd agree that it's very hard to not only break into cybersec, because as pen testers, as uh, offensive, actually, um, let's say uh, on the offensive part of this, uh, of cybersecurity, then it's even more difficult to break into, yeah? Uh, cybersecurity, it's, I guess, a bit easier if you've got the right contacts and uh, you've got a police CV, you've got uh, the certs, uh, but pen testing, it could get more tricky. So how I started is, um, uh, so the way I started actually, because uh, I was back in Greece, really, and I was doing the tech support, just like I said in the beginning. So... At some point, like I had finished with um, my military obligations and I really wanted to try it out. Yeah, I really wanted to, like I had so much enthusiasm. I wanted to go abroad, um, you know, especially the UK, uh, because it's still, even after Brexit, the center of, let's say, European cybersecurity. So I really want to go abroad and uh, try my luck, you know, get a job as an ethical hacker. Now that I'm thinking about it, like back then, I really like didn't know even half of what I know right now like I learned so much stuff on the way so what I did was I started applying to jobs um, I went on um, several platforms and uh, even though I didn't have commercial experience I didn't have um, the experience that you would take by a company or that you would take by let's say shadowing someone who's a professional uh, I did actually get the experience of uh, playing, for example, on bug bounty platforms and discovering bugs. And uh, if I remember correctly, Hack the Box was around 2017, 2016. So I started doing that 2018. So uh, I remember on my CV for the experience part, uh, there wasn't so much on it. Like I had the bug bounties. I had um, Hack the Box. I had um, some tests that I was actually uh, I was actually practicing with uh, friends and colleagues' websites uh, of mine. And I could, like, as a freelancer, uh, basically. So uh, I did actually put this on my CV to have something to show for in potential interviews, yeah. So basically, that's how I started. That's what I did. And then I started applying to jobs. Um, I got a lot of rejections, a lot of them. But uh, I was like so confident, uh, even with the knowledge I had back then, that I could find something. Yeah. So it, that's how it works actually with any kind of job. Yeah. You send 20, 30, 50 CVs and you only need to get one. Yeah. You only need to get uh, one offer. So basically, that's what I did. And uh, Eventually, I did receive an offer from a company called Nine, uh, which is actually a GDPR consultancy. So as part of the GDPR, um, there's the cybersecurity element. So 
uh, it was actually a pen tester uh, within the uh, 19. Um, I stayed there for a year, then I moved on to SensePost, which is actually a very popular UK consultancy. Uh, they operate in the UK and South Africa. And um, my day-to-day -day responsibilities, just like nine, included web pen testing, internal network pen testing, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, you name it, configuration reviews, um, and so on. Uh, so I stayed there for two years, and then I moved on to my uh, current role at Check One. Oh man, you got you got loads of gold in there. So bug bounty, right? You talked about certs. Yeah. Um, fully feel how the reject rejection rejection uh, piece works. I mean. In terms of people with their CV, phone number, and everything on there, when you're spraying and praying, you're literally sending everyone your information, right? What do you do to keep your OPSEC and, and maybe just a general OPSEC tip? Well, ideally, you should have two phone numbers, yeah? I mean, it's very easy, especially in the UK, like you get a SIM card for free, yeah? So you just have two phone numbers, or you can use a digital uh, phone number, which you can have. Uh, for interviews only, and this can be also your professional phone number. I mean, most companies um, give you some kind of an allowance for a phone, like for a phone device or a phone number. So ideally, you should have two phone numbers, one that you should put on your CV and another one for uh, your personal communication. And in regards to the CV itself, like the resume itself, uh, all you need is just, like in terms of uh, basic um, communication and uh, um, basic information actually about you. Just your name, your professional phone number, and the city that you live in, yeah? I've seen that a lot of times. People put their address on their CV, like their actual address where they live, and that's crazy. Like, Hello, the you know, yeah, like you don't know if the other person is on the company, like who's viewing your CV and who they've shared it with can know where you live. So just your phone number, your uh, first and last name, and London, you know, anywhere, the city that you live in, it's totally fine. I mean, um, and if you get on the first round, on the first interview, you can tell them, you know what, I'm five minutes away from you. I'm like 10 minutes away or I'm in a different city. You can then talk about the details. Yeah. I think that's a really good tip. So having a virtual phone number um, and then, because you get loads of spam calls anyway. So as long as it's going to a virtual one, you know, switch it off, spin up another number, you're all good, right? <laughs> I think it's a really good tip. So, like, in terms of, in terms of, like, uh, if we were to summarize tips, and we go over this in, in Clubhouse quite a lot, because we have loads of people trying to get in or level up. What are the, th I would say, what are your three tips uh, for people looking to level up or get in the industry? I would say my first, like, top like my top one tip would be to network, yeah? Uh, because not many people actually get that. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're still junior or you're still experienced. Um, you need to network. And what I mean by that is go on Clubhouse on our Red Team group or go to conferences or um, buy someone a beer or coffee on a like unofficial conference or message people directly on LinkedIn. If you have this, um, let's say, group of people that can vouch for you, that can support you, that can say good words, then everything else, like everything else becomes <laughs> so much easier. Uh, applying to jobs, uh, getting past the filters, um, getting uh, your offer more quickly, uh, your first uh, interview. So uh, everything becomes so much easier. So my first tip, the top tip I would give to people who are trying to break into or switch careers would be to get to know people that have already done that, that have already uh, gotten a job and work within the industry. So that's my top one. Uh, second one would be uh, to have, of course, a policy CV and to market yourself, yeah? I don't really like that term, to be honest. I don't really like um, saying, like, sell yourself and market yourself and make yourself more, uh, you know, sellable because uh, at the end of the day, it really comes down to soft skills and technical skills, of course. So I didn't like the term, but it's one of the 
things, it's part of the process, yeah? It's part of the process for any kind of job. So you have to mark yourself. And what I mean by that is you have to polish your CV, you have to polish your LinkedIn. You can't have uh, grammatical errors on your CV. You can't have uh, any kind of mistakes on uh, your CV. Um, ideally, you should have someone um, have a look over it, like someone more professional, more experienced, um, should have a read. Um, maybe they can spot any mistakes. Um, so polish your LinkedIn, polish your CV, make sure you find out about any um, potential, um, uh, let's say, uh, questions that you might be asked on an interview. Uh, any questions that uh, could pop up on Glassdoor? Like if you go on Glassdoor, you can find so many people uh, posting um, interview questions. Yeah, uh, posting everything literally. Uh, so make sure to be prepared um, in regards to selling yourself and marketing yourself. And the third one would be hardcore technical skills. Uh, that would be back bounties, CTFs. I mean, in 2022, we've literally got everything, yeah? You can go on GitHub and find a script yeah. for everything. <laughs> uh, Google is your friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> uh, anywhere you go, like, if I need a script, like, it, it, it's not even necessary to write it on your own, right? You can go on GitHub and you can find someone that has already written a script uh, that does what you want to do. Um, back bounties to show off your skills if you don't have commercial experience um, make sure you're listed on the hall of fame somewhere you've got points uh, hack the box you can show your level uh, or other CTFs uh, you can work on open source projects as well um, also you can try and shadow other colleagues like if you have friends who are, who are working in the industry you can try and shout them or send uh, uh, like your CV for an industry position uh, like right now, 2022, there are so many things, tons of things that you can do to uh, solve your experience. Uh, things that we didn't have back then. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, def definitely agree. Like, there's so much out there now that you can do. And yeah. you know, back then, five, ten years ago, you didn't have that. You didn't have like the hacker boxes mm -hmm. and and all these other yeah. CTF labs. And that kind of feeds into the second tip that you gave around marketing because. Yeah. If your technical skills are right and you've got a GitHub and you've got a hat the box rank, that feeds into your marketing around building your brand or building your profile and yeah. making yourself stand out from the crowd. And honestly, out there at the moment, there's like <clears throat> loads of pen test roles or offensive security jobs. It's, it's shocking yeah. what's happening in the market. COVID has definitely enhanced that side. So, yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. Number one, networking. Uh, to marketing around yourself and getting your technical skills. Yeah. Um, there's no point doing all this uh, fluff stuff uh, when <laughs> when you get the job, you can't do the job, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and uh, what you said about five years ago, I remember it was 2015 that there was nothing literally. Like, there were no online classes. Right now, you can find so many free classes on pen testing, on uh, so many platforms. Back then, we only had one or two like, we didn't have, uh, I think the equivalent of Hack the Box was a platform called CTF365. And that wasn't yes. even, you remember that one? Yes, yeah? I remember that one. Yes. Oh, yeah. It was even <laughs> Memory lane. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even active. Yeah. And if you wanted to, like, there was no try and hack me. Like, right now, literally, right now, you go to try and hack me and you can practice on the buffer overflow box you see on OICP. Yeah. There's literally. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Like, we didn't have the stuff back then. Um, so I, I used to go to Vunhub, download the VMs, the ISOs, get on the train on the way to work, spin it up on my laptop, and that was my practice time. <laughs> you didn't yeah, have online labs then. That was the only practice you could do, actually, for OSCP, because back then, like, before they raised their price, of course, uh, if you didn't want to sign up for the... Um, uh, for their uh, platform, for their uh, machines, like the only place you could practice was Vonhub, yeah? You downloaded the machine, uh, you spin it up, and then you had to uh, If you try broke your it. host system, that was it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You had actually, you had actually to configure it, like 
you had to download VMware or VirtualBox, you know, yeah. of your network. Yeah, make sure it's not uh, accessing your network, you know. <laughs> yeah, you learn so, networking skills, right? You learn operating skills, networking skills. Before you even got into hacking, there was a mission trying to get everything yeah. set up. And the same with scripting as well, because uh, as I said, right now you go on GitHub and you can find any script you'd like. Back then, like five years ago, 10 years ago, like there were no scripts. Yeah, you had to find maybe bits of pieces from maybe Stack Overflow and the other forum. And you need to know scripting in order to automate something. Yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah, definitely. Um, you would need scripting skills and networking skills. Uh, like if you want to be a pen tester 10 years ago. Um, but right now, at least we've got the tools. Yeah, we've got the resources. We've so got... with, with all the resources out there, what could you mention, like, yeah, and we get this question all the time, like what is what is the best resource or what is the best cert uh, to get? Yeah, um, that's a pretty good, good, good question, sorry. Uh, because cert actually... Um, to be honest, I'm kind of disappointed by certs, uh, by certifications, because we only have uh, only uh, a couple, maybe three, that are worth it. And I know we get this a lot, especially on uh, Clubhouse. Which kind of certs does someone um, need to go through before applying for jobs? Well, my personal recommendation, uh, my personal advice is to go for the ones that can get you that job more quickly. And what I mean by that? Uh, some people might think this is a mistake because if you go, for example, um, for a cert that's totally theoretical, yeah, and you don't learn any practical stuff, then you won't be as competent in your first job. And this is totally true. Uh, it's different, for example, to go for OSCP first or another practical cert or go for uh CRES certifications first yeah so even though like OSCP can teach you practical stuff can teach you technical skills yeah that doesn't mean it could get you a job uh, more quickly in the UK at least rather than CRES because uh CRES certifications eventually you will do it like eventually you, you get your all <laughs> they <laughs> have to do it in the UK <laughs> they will really like put in a position that you have to do that cert. So my personal recommendation is just go for the one that can get you that job quickly. Now, uh, I'm pretty certain that there's some people that might can't afford it. Yeah, they can't afford this kind of search. They cost thousands. Uh, it needs a lot of practice. Some people may work at the same time. Uh, so the second advice, uh, my second recommendation would be to go for certs that are less expensive. And uh, having said that, we've seen TCM as well. Uh, they're doing a great work. Uh, they're releasing free courses. So uh, up-to-date courses, actually. And we need to point that out because there are several courses that are, that are outdated in the market right now. So uh, TCM, cybersecurity, um, they're doing, of course, a great job. Udemy as well, you can find many courses for free there uh, for a very low price. So um, just before you go for practical certifications, um, you could go over this just for a, uh, I think it's 20 or 40 quid that you can try these courses for and get you up to speed, get you prepared. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with uh, TCM, the cyber mentor. I've got plain yeah. going on. Um, <laughs> that's what happens when you live in London, hey? Yeah. <laughs> right, so. Uh, TCM, uh, the cyber mentor, this guy is, is like a wizard, right? Cool. I don't know how he finds the time to do like YouTube videos and free cool. YouTube yeah. trainings and then, you know, craft out courses and he always has offers on and, you know, his content is, is really good. And like you said, uh, you know, great. keeping yeah, up to great. date with what's going on, um, he's on top of it. So definitely recommend that on like the lower range and I agree with you. Like you get certs on the higher end, which are like thousands. And then you get the lower ones as well, which have value and they're cheaper. It could be a good starting block, but ultimately you want to pick like one major one and like one or two small ones and not yeah. get like sidetracked with all the other stuff that is out there. Cause there are so many courses. Yeah. There are so many courses. And uh, you know what, if you've got the budget, like 
the company budget, training budget, or if you got like enough money in the bank, then feel free, you know, go ahead and get uh, 20 certs. But if you're beginning, then <laughs> I'd say try these small courses, you know, um, and then go for the big ones that can get you that job quickly. I would say it's a time as well, right? So it's you could have like, if you're in a position where you can buy certs and, you know, I just want to put a disclaimer, like when I started my journey, I put certs on credit cards. People would, you know, so yeah. don't do that or whatever for me it was like i'm investing myself so i put it on credit card because i know i'm going to be worth this whenever it comes but for those people who can afford it how yeah. do they manage their time or how do you manage your time to make sure that you're doing the certs right because there's no one getting 20 certs and you don't have the time with work and everything else yeah totally i mean when you're starting out and you might not have the money then of course, you will need to get, um, I guess, credit card could work for some people uh, or the first job. Eventually, you will be getting uh, that amount of money in order to start the certification uh, path. However, if you work at the same time, that's the biggest uh, challenge. And uh, that should be a challenge for me, actually. When you do work at the same time, how will you find the time to... Um, go for example and uh, crack some boxes or um, let's say practice it, it, it's very difficult you know and uh, this is where especially in the UK um, how we could differentiate ourselves as um, not only industry as uh, management as well because when you see somebody that's doing good work yeah you need to let them uh, practice for the certification, you need to give them some kind of uh, personal development time in order to study and uh, read for those certs. Um, so definitely um, getting like uh, a decent job that allows you to study for those certs uh, or on your free time, like on weekends, I know it sounds difficult, like <laughs> most certainly can't do it, especially like Imagine London, it's sunny in the weekend, yeah? <laughs> you need to grab that opportunity and go out instead of... Definitely. Uh, That's the worst. When the sun comes <laughs> out and you're at home, hacking, sitting behind a computer, and the whole of London is out. <laughs> I need to get out, you know. Uh, and you yeah. just got to suck it up and be like, look, I, I need to focus. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're, you've hit the nail on the head there in terms of, you know, support for, from your organization. And I think as you know, as time goes on and more people like us kind of go into that leadership management. I mean, I, I led a team uh, previously at the central bank, yeah. right? And one of the key things I said to my team was, you tell me what you're interested in and let's build a training plan around that and fit it into your workload. And even in terms of the work you're, you're doing, let's try and align it to what you're interested in, where you want to develop. And I think that mindset, um, needs to kind of continue with the people you know on the leadership positions because there's you can't expect someone to be doing pen testing flat out or red teaming flat out and they have an yeah. interest in whatever it might be but they don't have the time because the more they learn the more value they have the more value your your corporation or your consultancy yeah, will have yeah. and this is something as well that as uh managers i mean you're managing your own team yeah this is something that we need to pass on, yeah? Because if you do uh, work on that level with your employees, if you do find a way around these, um, let's say, um, work schedules, yeah? Uh, and you find time uh, to work on the certifications, then that's something uh, that your employee, yeah? I mean, maybe in a few years, they handle their own team, they manage their own team. Then they will do the same thing, yeah? Uh, on the other hand, if you don't do that, if you just put them on three internal assessments in a row, yeah, <laughs> and they have zero energy, then I, I, I completely agree. I was on the wrong side, right? This is why I have the, <laughs> the attitude I have. I've been there and they were like, hey, do this, do that. And yeah, don't worry. You learn somehow. Get up earlier. That's what I heard. I'm like, mate, I'm up at six. Um, yeah. Now I'm up at five. Like, I go up at six, you know, getting into London, central London's a mission trying to do everything else and you're like well where do I get more time um so the way that I kind of worked it out to get out of that catch 22 is 
I took holidays. So I, t- I block kind of studied. Yeah. I took holidays and in my holiday, you know, I told everyone I was still working and then that's where I kind of leveled up my skill. Right. So I want to kind of jump into red team stories, right. Or pen test stories, kind of like war stories. I want, I want to see something that you've seen that not everybody else has seen and maybe I don't know. So let's go for it, man. Like, well, give me a war story. Totally. I mean, I've got two of them. And uh, I'd start with the first one, actually, uh, because this was about uh, a fishing campaign. Yeah. So I was at my first role at nine um, and they had some kind of package. So they were selling a package that included a fishing campaign. So it was my job to build out the uh, templates, uh, the landing page, uh, write the email. Uh, you need to have some uh, actually marketing skills, copywriting skills to do a proper um, fishing campaign, really. Um, so there was a fishing campaign, actually, that uh, should have targeted uh, people from a school, yeah? That included uh, everyone, really, yeah? Could get, uh, let's say, uh, of course, they would provide me first with a list of the targeted users. Uh, of course, I could find more and more online, yeah? Uh, maybe I could find 100 online, but they sent me a target list of users. So I had prepared this... Uh, uh, this template, uh, and there is a good website on this. Uh, by the way, there is a lesson for everyone uh, at the end of this uh, uh, of this story. So uh, there is a website actually. It's called reallygoodemails.com, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which provides templates, email templates you can copy. Yeah, you just copy the code and then you can paste it on your um, uh, on your tool. I used to go office at the time, but any tool would suffice. Um, so my idea uh, at the time was to use uh, an Amazon email uh, that provided discounts for um, employees only, like for corporate account only. Uh, and that would imply that they would have to give their corporate account and their password um, in order to get that discount. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. So uh, if you search on that one, uh, by keywords, if you type Amazon, for example, you will see a lot of uh, templates. Um, Ooh, yeah. I like this. <laughs> oh, look so at I that. Used... Elastian as well. Yeah. I used actually one of those and I edited a little bit. I did the code to reflect up to 50% of uh, discount. Yeah. So uh, my landing page, of course, would be the Amazon uh, login page. Um, so I cloned that as well. And as soon as they typed their, uh, domain username and passwords, then I would have their credentials. So, um, this sounds actually, a uh, little bit good to be true. Yeah. Because you're not sure actually if your, um, email is going to be sent to spam. Yeah. Uh, you need to have like, uh, pre-configured domain, uh, you need not to include so many pictures or links that could send your email to spam. So I um, I was worried actually that uh, um, my email would go to spam because of the pictures, of the Amazon pictures. So uh, eventually I did run the phishing campaign and I did get uh, one username out of 30, I think. Um, it was the username and password of the front desk uh, of the school. So I didn't manage to get my, theoretically, uh, my first foothold, as we call it. However, the mistake that I did, and that's the lesson for everyone else, is that to make it more legit, I impersonated a person from the school. So even though, of course, I didn't use the, his email, I created a new, um, I think it was Gmail account or Hotmail account under his name. And then I added the email to reflect like his full name uh, and send this to everyone else. Um, so eventually, even if I um, go to that uh, username, um, I received an email from the client saying, you know what, if you were to impersonate someone, at least uh, gives us a heads up, yeah? At least, <laughs> at least tell us first before you yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> it's like... Uh... 
uh, scoping, right? Yeah. <laughs> At least tell us that you're going to break one of our people, right? It's, it's even a, like yeah. a, a HR kind of... Anyways, I'll let you continue. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that uh, they should have this on the scope of work for phishing campaigns, yeah? If the client wants to have someone impersonated by their company. So it's, <laughs> you know, a lesson for everyone that's trying to break into or sales managers, you know, people who do scope works. Uh, a lesson for everyone. That was one. Uh, uh, that was one story. The second one is from a very recent internal assessment that I did. So um, sometimes, like we get to hear these stories that end up. Sorry, these assessments that end up on some kind of uh, disciplinary action against the client. For example. Um, you go into internal assessment or um, like, and, and you see it's trivial to compromise them, yeah? Um, as, lo- as soon as you start scanning, you see an MS-17 vulnerability or a blue keep, and then you exploit it and you get domain admin in 10 minutes, yeah? And then you hear about uh, the client or the IT manager that got uh, some kind of action, disciplinary action or got fired or something, you know? And uh, you don't know how to feel. Yeah, I mean, you, you're just doing your job. <laughs> so, uh, and this is actually very, um, uh, very close to my story. Uh, I did find an MS-17, but it wasn't the one that got me um, the domain admin account. It was the one that got me, let's say, more lateral movement. However, um, I did manage to uh, relay an account got access to another computer and dumped the um, passwords uh, from the memory of another computer, actually. And this password, this account, was my client's account, like my client's, uh, the IT, IT admin's account. Uh, the client I was... Um, game over. <laughs> it was game over, yeah. I was like, wait, should I... Like, how, how should I put this in the report? How should I put this in my, like, the diagram, yeah? <laughs> that the IT admin's uh, password got dumped like through memory and then I was able to RDP into like my controller and get my domain admin. Like imagine what? him reading it with his uh, C-level uh, uh, managers or imagine them reading it and then they're like, wait, isn't that you? What just happened? <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's so. so common. It's in you see, and this is why they have like Red Forest or now moving into like the zero trust kind of model, yeah. because these admins are just logging on to any endpoint with these creds, yeah. and they don't realize they're leaving their creds in memory and all these assets. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's uh, and it's actually awkward as well. Like imagine you have a feedback call, and you explain to this person and their colleagues that I used your account, like the one that signed the scope of work, my client's <laughs> uh, name to compromise their name. It, 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 it's, uh, it's very weird, yeah. It's rude, actually. <laughs> uh, <Yes>. you know, <laughs> did, uh, you, did you see if there was another one available? <laughs> Just because yeah. he's going to be the one, he's the one saying, do the assessment because our security, yeah. I'm not sure about it. And you're the one going after him. <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't go after him actually. It just happened. Yeah, that, I, I know, but I like was, the, you know. the way that the CISO will see it, right? <laughs> it was luck, yeah? You know, it was just luck for uh, <laughs> luck for me. It was he was better. Yeah. Than me, so. uh, but yeah, I, but I totally agree that you know people getting fired on the back of like assessments, pen yeah. test assessments, you know, even physical assessments. You go in, yeah. I don't know if you've done physical engagements, and you go in and you, you get into like a physical place, and at the back of your mind, you're thinking this is the person that's going to get sacked because they just let yeah. me in <laughs> and I have to write this up and I have to be you all nice that. to them. Um, and they're probably going to get a call after this uh, because it'll be like a, a debrief after day one and day two, when I try and do the normal assessment, they're going to be like, no, we don't want you here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's crazy. But you know, at the end of the day, it's just a job, you know, you're just doing your job and uh, uh, you think at the best of your ability. So what can you do? From what you said, like in terms of crafting phishing campaigns, um, really good emails. That that was a really good resource, it, you know, yeah. pun intended, right? Um, really good emails, really good resource. Um, it doesn't look like it's, it's purpose is for phishing, but, you know, general marketing campaigns. Uh, 
Actually, yeah, it's probably not for fishing. Could be, but uh, I just yeah, found it. It, it looks like it's just for general marketing, and you can just abuse it yeah. and use it for fishing. Um, yeah. And I mean, yeah, from what you said, um, you know, for a good fishing campaign, you need marketing skills, you need writing skills, you need people skills. Um, so yeah, so, that that's what makes a social engineer. It, it, definitely, I mean, soft skills. Uh, I've been saying this a lot, and. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to say this once again so more and more people can uh, hear this. It is actually soft skills that are going to be leading um, uh, the conversation in a few years, yeah, especially in interviews. Because, and I've said this a hundred times, I'm still saying it on Clubhouse and everywhere else, like, you need to have soft skills. Um, hard skills, yeah, they're fine. I mean, any, anyone actually can learn how to run a scan or get roots, you know, the hardcore skills, you can learn them. You can, uh, you can uh, like learn them from a school, from a certification, but patience and um, more and more soft skills, persistence, for example, you can learn those. And these are the ones that eventually will get you that promotion, will get you that better job will get you more and more people in your network, people that can trust you. Um, so definitely soft skills is, I'd say, um, equally important as uh, hard skills. And it's, quite, it's quite overlooked as well, soft skills. And I think when people think about pen testing or breaking or red teaming, um, they think about the technical element, but there is, like you said, the soft skills, because you need to write a report at the end of it, you need to explain what you've done. You need to do a debrief with the client. There's no good spending four days testing when the final day comes for reporting and you have no idea how to write up what you've done. You need to be good at showing your work in, kind of like kind of like a maths test, right? Show your work in, how have you done it? Even if you haven't got in, what have you tried? What have you not tried? Um, so I, I definitely agree. Like soft skills is something which is overlooked and the way that you would improve it is, as you said, you know, going to networking conferences, going and just listening to people, how they communicate, maybe it's reading reports or um, shadowing on debriefs or whatever it may be. Well, you said the exact, um, the exact word that I was looking for, actually. Uh, you said overlooked, and this is totally true. Uh, soft skills are being overlooked as we speak right now. And I used to think... Um, the same, uh, I was in the same situation actually. Uh, when I started applying to jobs, like on the um, description, uh, soft skills are not being reflected. Like on the description, for example, a pen tester, uh, for a pen tester role, you see required skills, uh, BAS, PHP, you know, basic understanding or uh, Metasploits, whatever, other tools, uh, search maybe. And you might see in those um, uh, in the fine print, like you might see in those uh, descriptions, uh, good uh, communication skills, yeah? Um, because eventually, as you said, you have to talk with clients, you have to write a professional report. Uh, your English level should be good. Um, your speaking level should be good. Um, and talking with uh, clients uh, should be your first priority because apart from technical skills, hardcore skills, eventually you have to present those findings to managers and uh, C-level executives. Uh, so make sure to um, improve uh, your talking skills, your uh, English level, uh, whatever. Uh, one good tip, and this doesn't apply to everyone, uh, but it would be nice to try if you had the opportunity, is to try and get a job at a call center, yeah? So that's actually my first tip um, for anyone who's trying to improve their soft skills. Uh, get a job at a customer support center or a call center. If you talk with customers on a daily basis or if you're emailing them, then eventually you will learn uh, to handle them. You will learn uh, that uh, soft skills is very important. Um, so yeah, if you got the opportunity, just uh, go for it and you won't regret it. You know, I started from uh, customer support center and 
up to this day is like the job that made me more, uh, I say, an extrovert in terms of, uh, you know, my job professionally at least. Yeah, and even retail. So having that customer experience one-to-one. Um, cool. I think there's some a really good story. So in terms of like cybersecurity and where we are now, like what are the key things that you think are a problem and where do you think this is going the next like five to 10 years? I'd say um, one problem right now that uh, I've been seeing a lot and this is actually something that uh, most of the people in the industry are seeing on LinkedIn or uh, Twitter or any other platforms. Every day uh, we see new vulnerabilities coming up, yeah? Uh, some may have uh, like a publicly available exploit, some may not. Uh, and then again, the next day, we see a story about a comment that's uh, being hacked uh, by an um, inactive user. Like somebody quit a few years ago, a few months ago, or um, they were let go and their account was still active. So someone just guessed their password and used the VPN panel to get access. So even though there are um, lots of uh, measures in place, yeah, um, like for example, five years ago, yeah, I, I don't think that the patch policy of uh, companies was as good as it is now, or uh, like their password policy and all of that. Like today, yes, we do have um, zero trust. Uh, policies, we do have um, ID departments going to the cloud, um, you know, for their efficiency and everything. But again, social engineering, I'd say, is one of the um, first problems, like real world problems that we're seeing uh, right now. And just like uh, we talked earlier about the um, the website, really good emails. This wasn't even um, supposed to be a phishing platform, yeah? I just found this and I thought, wait, <laughs> you know, that could be used for a phishing campaign. So uh, whatever the patching policy, whatever the password policy, any other, like zero trust policies, everything, like uh, we've improved so much over the years. Uh, but social engineering, is still um, a real world problem. Yeah, and you know, to to going back to what you said, um, in terms of like technical vulnerabilities, like we are getting there, we are patching things, yeah. but it's those human mistakes. So you talked about the misconfiguration or the inactive accounts. That's a human um, issue that they've missed, right? And because of that, there may be some passwords lying there. There may be uh, users that potentially are inactive but not really inactive because their account still works um and then social engineers come in uh, and abuse that and because the security teams think that it's legitimate it just bypasses exactly. your traditional controls um exactly. yeah even with physical intrusions as well like somebody throws a few usbs out the outside the door then an employer sorry an employee just plugs it in their computer so there goes your uh, zero trust policy. Imagine you have a zero trust policy on devices, like you can hook up any devices and then <laughs> it just plugs in the USB. <laughs> it's done, you know? <laughs> uh, like boom, boom. Game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just came over. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, social engineering is a problem which is even greatly kind of accelerated because of COVID, because of us remote working um we see so many yeah. vulnerabilities and stuff coming out now but social engineering is still number one on the radar you know no matter how many controls you want to put in place in terms of technology you're not educating your users um if you're employing the right people or just you know general people that don't care <laughs> you know I, I think i said this story before but you know i i came across someone that would see an email that's come to their personal email address and then forward it to their corporate a corporate email 
and open it there because they wanted to check if it was malicious because they know that their corporation has more security than their home network <laughs> and i was like blown away i was like how do you even like where where's your thought process around so going back to users and humans are the weakest kind of link in this um so it, it's good that you're you're kind of seeing that as well absolutely yeah i mean uh, and it's also overlooked especially in europe I think in the US it's more common um, to get physical intrusions, to get uh, social engineering uh, attacks, uh, and it's more common to pay someone in order to uh, conduct all of those things at your corporation. I think in the UK or Europe, uh, we're still catching up a bit. I uh, haven't heard lots of stories about, uh, uh, you know, USB dumping or physical intrusions or social engineering. Uh, I think in Europe and the UK, we're still catching up a bit in terms of uh, this kind of attacks and professional assessments, respectively. Where do you see this going in like five to 10 years? Where, where do you see, you know, we, we spoke about Russia um, and Ukraine at the start of this chat. You know, are we, are we going to see more of that? I, I know we're seeing more vulnerabilities. I know Samsung got popped. Um, what a couple of days ago whatever it was um you know the likes of solo wins that was last year like, wh and where do you see it headed where i see headed is um of course more and more occasions of um leaks uh on the internet yeah of um private information uh and it was um a few weeks ago actually that i posted on linkedin about a company that did PCR tests, actually. And uh, this company sent an email to its customers, which included a link to their customer database. And this database had everything on it. It had addresses, it had mobile phone numbers, it had everything. So where I see um, that uh, this whole, let's say, um, um, and the war with uh, Russia and this whole procedure and the leaks is we're going to see a lot more in the coming years. And what we're going to see more often as well is, uh, again, social engineering attacks. So it's vital to, um, you know, train your employees and um, not even with boring videos or boring emails, Um just with something more interesting that can actually convince them not to click on an email, you know, not to click on a um, uh, on a link. And uh, it will get more advanced. For example, uh, we saw, I think it was a few years ago, the attack on WhatsApp with Jeff Bezos. So they sent him a video on WhatsApp and he clicked on it and they got access to, the, to his phone. So... Um, definitely we will be seeing more and more advanced attacks that could uh, trick experienced users, yeah? So um, apart from the leaks and uh, uh, the technical attacks, let's say, I think it's more vital to just train your employees in a more efficient way um, to not get uh, tricked by those uh, phishing emails. So, so you brought up a good point, you know, more leaks, and I definitely think that's on the radar. And... You know, for those who don't know much about the social engineering aspect, it builds on open source intelligence. So things like the leaks greatly benefit what an attacker can do and how they can craft that. Um, so we are seeing more leaks. Uh, I think we will continue to do so, especially with what we're seeing on like the Russia, Ukraine stuff and how many government docs are being leaked and personnel information, yeah. which is going out there onto the deep web and dark net. Um, and, and I suppose this is a perfect opportunity to plug a picnic and, you know, what the company that I'm working for now does. Um, so it re reduces your digital footprint to make you less susceptible for social engineering attacks. So I'm going to plug it on the screen. So plug. Um, oh. All right gonna come up here there we go look at that um we stop humans hacking humans so and and for those who are thinking 
right, I'm just plugging this. Um, so from an early age, I loved the idea of being a social engineer. I've done, I've done so many physical engagements. I like tricking like the family and stuff like that. So from an early age, this was a real passion for me. Um, and then I got approached by Picnic and they were like, hey, we're, we're building this, this tool um, and we're going to reduce um, social engineering attacks by reducing the footprint of individuals and therefore the organizations will be more protected. And I was like, oh man, that sounds awesome. So what it does, and Dimitri, me do some checks on you and, and I wanted to kind of go into your life, but it seems like you've done some really good OPSEC on yourself um, as cybersecurity professionals do. Um, so yeah, I mean, craft an efficient campaign for you. I'd probably look at uh, maybe sec one related, maybe conference, yeah. um, maybe give you a, a maybe give you like a black hat, <laughs> free complimentary speaker yeah. pass or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, a picnic, uh, getpicnic.com is a URL. Uh, you know, we're hitting the market. We've come out of stealth. Uh, we, it, this is an issue. Social engineering is an issue. And I don't think, and I'll, I'll stop sharing this for a sec so you can get us on screen. But I do think that there's going to be more things like this coming out. When we yeah. think about organizations and, you know, your pen tester and we've been in this realm for a while when we think about activities, it's all within the network. Like what happens in the network yeah. when you think about phishing, and this is where kind of the assume breach model comes in. And even if you're on a red team assessment, you're like, Hey, I'm going to fish for two weeks. And if I don't get in for two weeks, we're just going to assume breach because you know that yeah. someone's going to click at some point. Uh -huh. So you yeah. could be doing, yeah, you could be doing recon or on environment for a while and you could be crafting and building catfishing profiles, yeah. or whatever it may be, but humans are always going to be your weakest link. And you know, re reducing that footprint for an attacker would, I wouldn't say remove the threat completely, but it would minimize the attack surface that the organization would face. That's also the truth, yeah. I mean, and that's why not only on the assumed breach scenario, on standard penetration tests, what we do is sometimes we ask for credentials, yeah? And uh, sometimes on internal penetration tests, uh, we do ask, for, uh, of course, not a domain administrator account <laughs> from the beginning, but uh, our first foothold, yeah? Because even if we... Uh, <laughs> Give me a domain admin, that's it. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, so, hey, I'll pop you in two hours. And you're like, yes, mate, you gave yeah, me a domain yeah. admin account. <laughs> All right, sorry, go on. Totally, yeah. I mean, what I want to say is right now on, on assessment, yeah? Red team, whatever. What are your two... Uh, most probable ways of getting into um, the internal network for breaching the external perimeter is through a vulnerability. Maybe we get an RC uh, somewhere, or maybe they have um, uh, unpatched software. Uh, you get an RC, you're in, or phishing campaigns. Yeah, you go to uh, you gather uh, hundred emails. Yeah, you go to Intellex. Uh, you get all their passwords of users. Um, you check bridge databases and <laughs> it's a matter of time when you get your first foothold. So um, definitely uh, reducing your uh, presence online is something that's uh, going to be viral in, uh, in the coming years. So thanks for, uh, you know, not getting too much information on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't. I, yeah, come on, you're a good friend as well, right? So I don't want to expose uh, right. <laughs> on, the, no. on the internet. <laughs> um, but yeah, you you mentioned a really good site there, and um, oh, yeah. I want to bring it up. Intel X, right? Uh. For those who don't know, um, check check this website out, especially if you're like coming up, you want to do some OSIN. Uh, like uh, I'll share it on screen now. Um, yeah, there we go. You can find loads of there weird you go. stuff. Intel yeah. X, right? So just put in what you want there domain, URL, email, Bitcoin address. Um, it will do some nice searching. So, yeah, uh, I mean, that, that's a really good resource you plugged. Any more phishing resources you want to plug? Phishing resources? Well, I do have it's not actually a phishing resource, it's a tool. And uh, it's called cross-linked. So basically, what it does is it gathers the um, names of LinkedIn, 
I think you need to type tool, yeah, GitHub or crosslink tool. So what it does basically is that it gathers the name uh, of uh, someone on LinkedIn, the names of the employees of a company, and then you provide it with the uh, structure, like the email structure, and it generates a list of um, emails that you can try against, uh, you know, VPN panel or on brute forcing. Uh, that doesn't mean, of course, they're all true, yeah? Not all emails uh, are valid. So it's up to you to determine actually which ones are valid and which ones are not. Um, for example, if you're running um, a spraying attack, a brute force attack on uh, Outlook, yeah, on OWA, then um, you would have like 200 users through this uh, tool. And then, of course, if you're running through Metasploit, for example, it will tell you which one of them are true, which ones of them are valid, uh, which accounts um, are valid and which ones are not. So you can then use them to short uh, shortlist the, the accounts. Uh, so that's one tool that uh, I use. I have used many times actually. Like whenever I find uh, on the web app on the external infrastructure assessment, whenever I find a panel, you know, uh, especially VPN or WA, I just fire up this tool and you know, exciting moment. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just trying to find um, another tool. Well, more of a more of like a graph that came across my radar. It was yesterday. Uh, don't know how responsive this is going to be. But yeah, I mean, that's a really good tool. I also need to add up something uh, on to what was said earlier about links and uh, emails, phishing emails. It's not only that. It's not only this kind of information that um, you can give out to any potential attackers, yeah? Because with a phishing email, they might get your password, uh, which is, of course, very serious, or they might get, uh, let's say, access to your computer or whatever. Uh, but uh, this is going for the kill, as we said. Yeah, this is going uh, too far away. Um, I saw a, um, a poll on LinkedIn. Yeah, and uh, I sent this over to you, um, and it's on LinkedIn as well. So there were two polls done by um, different employees, actually. One of them was about the password policy. If you go over to my message on LinkedIn, you will be able to see uh, those screenshots and put them over on screen. So one of them was the password policy. Uh, there was one analyst uh, that uh, uh, created a poll on LinkedIn, um, which said, uh, which asked about uh, where does it get, what's the closest, like the, your password policy gets to the following examples, yeah? And it had several weak passwords like, um, password at 2020, like capital P, and four examples. Uh, so it had, I think, 1,600 votes, like 1,600 people voted um, on this poll. They replied. So this guy have access uh, to the password policy of the companies that these people are working for. And uh, there was another example, actually, about... Uh, I think it was the operating system. Um, there was a picture. Uh, so this person created a picture of the different logos, yeah, of operating systems, like uh, for um, Linux, for uh, Windows, and so on. Um, and uh, they said on the description uh, that you can react um, depending on the operating system that you use right now. So I think it was thumbs up for Windows. Uh, it was, um, um, I think it was a hard like for uh, Mac, Mac OS. And it also had around 5,000 uh, replies, 5,000 votes. Um, so let's say, imagine if that was the same person, yeah? He's got the password policy of the company that these people are working for. He's also got the operating system, so he knows uh, what kind of payload uh, he should craft in order to attack these people. So at the end of the day, it's basically awareness, uh, basic awareness that you need to have. Uh, Again, just individuals, right? It's like yeah, exactly. you just expose your your password policy. So while you're filling out a LinkedIn poll, <laughs> asking for hey, what, what what's your password look like? You've been directly told everyone, hey, my password is in this structure. 
let me spin up a hash cat and start cracking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course, it's going to be set forward all the time. It's not, not going to be an email, yeah? It could be a LinkedIn poll or it could be an SMS. We've been seeing lots of those, especially with banks, um, phishing uh, campaigns, you know, uh, SMS, which are uh, which include a link. Um so, yeah, uh, basic awareness, actually. You don't have to be technical or you don't have to know um, penetration testing. Just basic awareness that, uh, yeah, could help along the way. So one of, one of the final things I want to do, I, I saw this come up yesterday. Um, it's from, uh, let's have a look, New Zealand. I think it's New Zealand government that that launched this, right? And it was about ransomware and the life cycle of the ransomware event. Uh, I will share it. There we go. So it all begins with initial access, and you can see here. You know, we discussed about phishing, getting valid cred. So there might be, you know, whether inactive accounts or you know genuine accounts, and we use password guessing or part of brute forcing. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned exploitability for vulnerabilities and then you've got email again. So yeah. there we go. Human, 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 technical. While these, these yeah. technical vulnerabilities are, are getting better, human, human, human <laughs> is still going out. And, you know, to find your exposed internet services, is not hard. You just go to Shodan. Um, hopefully you guys know about that. Go to Shodan, find it. Obviously, malware um, documents. Uh, we always use Office documents. It's still the best way to do it. And bypass defenses in terms of malware, you, you can do reconnaissance on that again. Um, and then you've got your command and control. And then once you're in, do what you need to. And then exfiltrate, encrypt data, yeah. do what you need to do. It's done. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it's a nice, um, it's a nice life cycle right there, uh, a nice graph right there. Uh, because... Just like we said, you know, facing campaigns, that's going to be like nine out of ten times you get initial access uh, as a red team or a pen tester, whatever it's going to be, uh, facing campaigns, it's going to be some kind of password guessing, an email, malicious document, could be uh, some kind of vulnerability. Um, but again, if we're talking about a company that, let's say, uh, takes care of their um, Let's say infrastructure, yeah, because there are companies that have been pen tested before. They have hired professionals before to do red teams, to do pen testing. So there might not be any um, unpatched software of any kind exposed. Um, so again, phishing campaigns going uh, to be your first way in. Right. So with that, any last final tips you want to give uh, the, the viewers or listeners? Well, uh, just to summarize, um, I guess the first lesson would be don't impersonate someone on the facing campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you have uh, in, in scope. Make sure you've got authority. <laughs> Make sure you've got in scope. Uh, second one would be just think before you click on anything that possibly looks suspicious. Yeah. And Third one, networking, you know, get to know more people uh, of the industry that you want to break into. Um, get into um, Twitter, LinkedIn, Clubhouse, uh, go out with uh, uh, people uh, that can get you, you can open the doors for you, you know, uh, they can say good word and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Cool. Any any final uh, things that you're working on? How do people get in touch with you? Well, you can always find me on uh, LinkedIn. Um, you can always find me on Clubhouse with Manit. I try to do my best to be there every Thursday. Uh, <laughs> um, and besides that, um, well, we've got the groups on Signal. Uh, you can always, but you, you can just send me an email. Yeah, you know. On, on LinkedIn, yeah, I send you a phishing link. Oh, yeah. we're on Discord as well, right? So if you if you're yeah. on Discord, uh, we're on Discord as well. Oh, Dimitri's you're, you're on Discord. They want to talk to you personally. Um, Just on Twitter, send some uh, pictures or something. <laughs> I try to check all of them 
like uh, at least every two days. So I will make sure that uh, your message gets read. Cool. Well, I mean, it's great having you on the show. Um, you know, sure, this is our third episode. So, you know, I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you enjoy doing it, Dimitris. Uh, Absolutely. Man. Are you kidding? Of course, it was great. It was yeah, a, I, I really great do. we do need to link up, right? Soon. <laughs> totally, man, totally. We're going to make this happen, you know. Uh, it's great. Great initiative that you do this podcast. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was nice talking to you today. Um, and anyone who might have questions, how to break into the industry, uh, tools, whatever, just hit me up, you know. Cool. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I'll just wrap up and do an outro. So um, thank you guys for listening. Uh, I hope you got some value out of this conversation. If you do want to come on the show or if you do have any comments, then please leave them down below. Um, if you're on the podcast, then yeah, hit us up on Twitter or Discord or, or LinkedIn. Um, yeah, like, subscribe, um, and then we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you for being here.